give that waiting period. So we might implement earlier than the 10 instructional days, uh, but if the student's already been eligible, then we will they will follow that we go that we'll implement the IEP on the 11th day. Uh, if that timeline can be interrupted, if one of these these events listed happen. So if the parent requests an additional meeting. Um, and or mediation or due process, then that would halt the implementation of that of that IEP. Uh, so if those things happen in the way the IEP system works, we just wouldn't implement the IEP. We'd stop, we'd get into a stay put mode and stay with the previous IEP. Um, and we have a question here about can a school system post date an IEP after an ACR due to a summer birthday? Um, I don't believe so. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. No, I don't. I don't think that's allowable. It's just one of those things. You know, it really makes it difficult when the birthday falls at a certain time. Um, end of you know, end of July, and the school would be out, and you'd have to get your uh, evaluation done, and your case conference done, and your um, IEP in place before they exit for the school year so it's up and ready to go. So no, you cannot post date it, but the problem with that is when kids are that young and I'll shorten this up, when they're that young, so much can change in just a month and a half or six weeks. Um, they're just, they've only been on the planet for a little while and, and that can make a huge difference in their level of need. So it's just one of those things, but no, I don't believe you can post date the, I, the IP or the ACL. Right. And what Bruce said earlier with that timeline, when the, we have the summer birthdays, a lot of school districts try to hold all those meetings before the end of the prior school year just to, but you know, you're going to have the situations where students just appear and you're better off being honest and here's what the timeline, here's what happened and documenting those pieces in the IEP rather than trying to backtrack and post date pieces. Uh, you're much better off to, to be honest and just record what actually happened. Make sure you document those pieces in the IEP and the notes. So it's real clear what, what the events uh, led up to where, where you landed at the end. Thanks for that question, Bruce. Thanks for your answer. So one of the big pieces that we have to consider with an IEP is that it must be implemented as written. So that's one reason we have that, a careful review when we have move-ins, careful review as we start a school year and as we start developing an IEP is so to make sure we understand what we are promising in the IEP and what that's going to look like in the course of a school year. So um, we can get in a lot of trouble if we decide not to implement the IEP as it's written or if we make some executive decisions along the way. So we want to make sure we understand the IEP and we implement it as it is. Because this is the student's version of a free and appropriate public education. So if we start to um, unilaterally make changes there, we can get into a real, real trouble uh, legally for those considerations. So as far as responsibility for implementing the IEP, so once it's done and we are rolling with the IEP, the teacher of record is primarily responsible for the implementation. The teacher of record must be appropriately licensed or trained if licensure is not available. And, and then the administrator is also responsible for that staff that they supervise. So we do have some situations. I know I had someone I was teaching that I was not uh, licensed for students with significant behavior needs, but I had a lot of them, I was a teacher of service for many of those students. So we had a teacher on staff who was licensed. They were their technically, technically their teacher of record while I served, I served that student in the classroom. So that's one way those things can be done. You just have to be careful, make sure that person does have a, a, a invol is involved in that student's education. Of course, administrators are ultimately responsible for that as well to make sure that our staff is appropriately in place for the student. We have the services needed and the students have the supports just like the IEP is uh, enumerates. So you have to make sure that ultimately falls back to you. So what is the administrator's role in how the IEP is, uh, I'm sorry, implementing the IEP as written? Again, part of it is being aware of what, what's in the IEP making sure that the services are provided in the, in, in the means or the terminology that's been in the IEP. So as the IEP is written, we wanna make sure we have everything in place. So we're faithful to the written IEP and not just, I guess not just the written word, but also the spirit of it so that we get the services in place for the student and we're aware of what our staff needs to make sure they have a thing, this, the 
tools that they need to serve the student and the supports that are required just to, to continue working with that individual. And that really comes to fidelity. You know, implementation of any program really relies on fidelity. So just being faithful uh, here, when we put, that, put the IEP together and more or less making a promise to the parents and family that here's what we're gonna provide for the student, here's what it's going to look like, and we wanna be true to that whenever possible. Um, and so we just wanna make sure the services and supports we agreed upon are delivered. And we wanna make sure as an administrator that we identify whatever training and resources are necessary and then make them available to the teachers and staff that support the student. One of the things that came up for me a lot was, you know, students with more significant behaviors. We have students with uh, autism that were in our schools and not always were the general education staff aware of what to do or how to handle those kinds of situations. So, and nowadays, you know, it's even students with dyslexia, making sure that we inform our teachers we are required to train them, make sure they're aware of how to best teach those individuals, what's good strategies, what's good intervention, and what's best for these individuals, and make them aware. We don't, we don't want a student with a behavior plan in a classroom where a teacher's not aware of it, you know, because the gen ed teacher's got a huge role in that student's education and a role in carrying out that behavior plan. So it's important that we have good communication and we're faithful in delivering that. And where it falls to an administrator is making sure those resources are available and we're aware of uh, offer training when necessary, offer support when necessary. It doesn't, ne doesn't mean there has to be an outside entity doing those things, but internally, who are my experts in this area and how can I make sure that my teachers and staff have what they need so they can best serve those students in their classroom, give those kids the best chance to succeed if at all possible. Any qu questions about those pieces? Any questions there? That's just talking about the uh, implementation and, the, and fidelity of the involvement for our uh, administrators. And then when we get into leading IEP meetings, it comes a little more details. We'll get into some things that, that Bruce mentioned earlier as well. Okay. So one of the things that comes up a lot is just general etiquette at a case conference, you know, making people feel welcome Focus on the meeting, um, stay in, in, be in the meeting when you're there and stay there as long as you possibly can, hopefully throughout the whole meeting. Uh, as a public agency representative, we're gonna get to talk a little bit about how important that role is and to possibly conceive that it's, if at all possible, well, I'm sorry, to conceive that it's okay just to leave the meeting when it's inconvenient for, for, for you to be there is, is really hard to understand. Sometimes you have to leave early, but, there's a lot of decisions going to be made in that meeting that as a public agency representative, you want to make sure you have your um, do uh, your say in. You know, it's important to know as much about the child as possible and those eligibilities, because one of the ro roles as a public agency representative is to know the student and their needs, but also know what our school has to offer. So know how our services work, know what services are available or we can make available so we can faithfully answer the questions that parents have at the meeting. Um, we talked about the procedural safeguards already that must be shared. You should have a running knowledge of what's in. So if the parents have questions, you can go back to it and refer to it and talk to them about their rights. Um, and Bruce already hit this really well is, you know, let the students needs dictate the, the meeting. They talk that the students needs drive the individualized education program and that's it. You know, whether how, what we have available, what we don't have available, it, we have to figure out a way to meet the students' needs based on what we do have and how are we going to do it. Gonna, and it's going to call for some very creative solutions sometimes to figure out how we're going to serve the student that comes in with, with needs that we've not seen before. So it's important to have an open mind and be aware that we'll, we have to figure it out. Um, the sample agenda, one thing that we find very helpful in a case conference is to have a consistent agenda. I'm not going to go through this line by line, but um, it's, it's nice to be consistent. So when, you're, when your staff goes out and ca at case conferences, you know what they're doing. Here's, and you have a line, you have guidance on what to say in each piece so that you know are consistent in those meetings. Um, it, I think it's important too to have, if you're gonna use an agenda, use it all the time. Don't single out a group of parents just because you think it might be a difficult situation and you need an, need an agenda to refer to. Uh, use it all the time. It's efficient. It helps. It helps to move meetings along, 
and it helps us stay on track because uh, we can always refer back to it. Hey, we need to stay on this and keep our, our meeting moving. Bruce, do you have that? I do. I, I just want to remind our, you know, as administrators, and if you're looking um, to support your teachers of record that usually chair case conferences, you somewhere embedded in there, and I'm not exactly sure where, somewhere around the present levels, I believe it's in present levels and discussion of testing results accommodations, is the piece about um, parent input, uh, parent concerns. I've had, I don't know where it came from, but for a while we had some, uh, some of our teachers, a lot of teachers would, would like to interject that piece of the IEP sort of at the end of the meeting. They'd run through everything, all the decisions be made, and then at the end they'd say, now to get your input, do you have any concerns? Mm -hmm. it, it is where it is in the order of the IEP for a reason. It's there. So if they do have a concern, you can address that in a service or an accommodation or in the notes. If it's a disagreement, you don't want to wait till the end. The, the best case scenario for a, 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 a compliant IEP, a defensible IEP is there's the parent concern that they verbalized. They're worried about their child's uh, decoding skills. And then lo and behold, there's a decoding goal later. Or lo, lo and behold, there's an accommodation for additional time when they, they say they're, they're worried their child can't finish things, an exam on time or a test on time. And there it is later on in the IEP. So it's important to do that in the way that it's designed. Sorry, Matt. No, that, was, that was a really good point. Thanks, Bruce. To go, you know, that there's, it is important that we have parent involvement throughout the process from beginning to end. And it, it's kind of reflected, I think, you know, when you look at the IEP system, those, those notes are at the bottom of every single page. So as you have your interaction with parents, whether, like you mentioned, if, it, if there's space in the IEP to write it and to support what they're, they're asking for, you have those, that opportunity. But if it's, there's not room on that page for that, there, there's, those notes are there to capture that interaction, whether it's a thought, concern, or addition, just show evidence that you, you took their, their word and you're listening to what they have to say. And if you agree or don't agree, uh, that's not really the point. The point is we did listen and consider their input. And if we ultimately decide to go a different way, we, we, we're going to document that also. So that's part of the, part of the process. So parent consent to excusal. This, is, this can be a little sticky sometimes because technically consent for excusal from parents. So if you're, you're getting ready for a case conference and a member of your, of your team, as you can see the, the five folks that are listed here, um, if one of them would like to be dismissed from the meeting, either in whole or in part, um, then they need prior written consent from the parents to do that. Now that only stands for these individuals that you, if you have multiple more people than this invited to your meeting, this doesn't necessarily apply to them. However, you would want to have their input in writing uh, to share up the meeting if they need if they can't be there for some reason. So if someone's not on this list, another teacher, a related service provider, or a speech pathologist, possibly, uh, you would want their written uh, comments so you can share those at the meeting and and go from there. But uh, part of the IEP system does for this the notice of case conference. Uh, embeds this process within it. So we'll just make sure ahead of time you have those conversations. Do you need to be do you need to be excused early or can you not be there for this meeting that's been scheduled so we can get parents with prior written consent. Now the issue you're going to run into is if the parent does not consent to that excusal, uh, what is the plan? Especially if you don't know that until the day of the meeting or right before of that particular meeting. So sometimes it's going to lead to a reschedule Sometimes it might lead to a continuation if someone's got to leave early, uh, but the parent doesn't consent to the running the meeting without them. So we might have to we might have to um, continue that meeting onward another at another time, and that's possible as well. It's, it's important that we document all those things well. But what we don't want to get into is just excusing someone in the middle of a meeting without a prior written consent, even if the parent even if the parent says that's okay. If the as a teacher of record or uh, maybe a general education teacher, I asked to be excused. The key is prior written consent. So it can get a little sticky there if someone asks to leave just in the middle of the meeting. Uh, and like I mentioned, every time I talk about this thing, uh, real life happens. So you have to, you need, do need to think about how we're going to handle situations that arise like that. But this person does have to leave right now. So let's talk about a continuation. Let's meet again. 
and let's get that figured out before we uh, get too deep into the meeting. Because sometimes when you get too far along, people can get a little upset when someone needs to leave and they haven't talked, spoken about that already. So just handle those things up front whenever possible. And the prior written consent makes it easier if we have it already. And that, that's something to consider as far as it, part of a district policy. So uh, as you have uh, no prior, if you have not gotten, gotten prior written consent and someone does have to leave or has to miss part of a meeting, then what is the policy? Let's put it all in writing. So this is what we do every single time uh, and make sure that you're consistent across the board because that can be really confusing for a parent if one year it works this way and the next teacher it works a different way. So we wanna make sure we're consistent with our policy uh, across the board and, and that policy and procedure guide that we're required to have uh, should contain those documentations. So one, one role that we've talked about briefly already is that public agency representative. And we talked about this a little bit uh, in, ter in these terms previously, but the public agency must designate a representative who meets these criteria as knowledge of about the availability of and has the authority to commit resources of the public agency. Whenever you see public agency, that just means school, uh, is qualified to provide or supervise or vision of specially designed instruction to meet the unique needs of the student with disabilities and is knowledge about the general education curriculum. So they need to know about the cert resources we have to bear, have authority to commit them, uh, qualified to provide or supervise specially designed instruction and knowledgeable about the general education curriculum. So that is a pretty big, um, I don't know, pretty long list of information really to, get, to have a handle on. So you have to know what you have available, know what the student needs, and know what the require, what's going on in the general education classroom enough. That's going to help you guide the decisions of that meeting. So someone there, this is the role you're playing is the person to answer those questions. I need to be able to respond to parents' requests. What do we have in place for these students? What does the general education curriculum look like? What does specially designed instruction look like in your buildings? Uh, we need to know those things so we can best answer questions for the, around at the meeting and best serve students in, as we design those IEPs. That's one of the reasons, that, and one the required people that we have in a meeting when we go through this, the main reason that we have those folks required is so we don't have to leave the meeting to get the answers. So the people are in the room that have the answers to these questions. So we don't have to go down the hallway and say, let me go talk to the principal. The person who can answer that could, should be in the room with us. So it's really key um, sorry, as you look at this con concept, a lot of districts will have a designee that will fill as a public agency representative. That designee needs to be able to fulfill this role as well. So if I designate someone else to fill the role as a public agency representative, that person can make these as knowledge and authority to commit resources of the public agency. So when you provide, the, give someone that, or designate someone as a public agency representative, they have the authority to commit resources. You've just given that, inferred that upon them, uh, conferred that upon them, I guess. Um, so that that's a, that's a, can be a tricky thing. Just be sure you're aware of that as you're going, as you, if you designate someone else in that role. Uh, Bruce also talked about this idea of predetermination. And that's one of the things that we have meetings, so it's okay to meet with parents prior to a case conference. It's okay to meet with your team prior to a case conference. What's not okay is to predetermine the outcome of the case conference. So it's important that we still honor that case conference as the final decision maker and we can review information together. We can look at evaluation components, uh, but we don't get to determine the eligibility or placement without having a case conference first. Uh, and this also can be uh, turned around a little bit to like, a, a, well, a term that I've heard before used is called shoehorning. Uh, when you have a student that meets criteria and you try to shoehorn them into a program that you already have. And so you have to be careful about those pieces that every student in special education dessert has individual specific rights. So it's important we look at their needs and design a program around that their, those needs. And it might look like a lot like what we already have, but there'll be some varieties that are specific to that individual. Um, so just keep in mind, we have to consider parent input and suggestions. We don't want to determine placement before the case conference. Uh, the, the student's disability does not make, make them eligible for any specific placement or program. 
Uh, that's all determined when we get together uh, and we look at our options. Uh, we wanna make sure we present the student as a gen ed student first and then work away from there. Uh, meaningful parent participation. We've already kind of talked about this a bit. Um, we get into some, some conversations about mutually agreed upon time and place to make sure we have made every, made our, our given parents an opportunity to respond um, to those requests for meeting times. A mutual agreed upon time and place is not just the parents' convenience, but also the school agency, public agency's convenience. So uh, we have to figure out a middle ground there, somewhere we can both live with uh, if there's some discussion going back and forth. Uh, make sure the parents' voice is obvious in the, in the notes that you take and that they're a participant in that meeting. So one of the things that's kind of silly to talk about, but it goes back to the etiquette conversation that how do you greet parents when they come into a room? What does it look like when they enter a case conference room? When you're all, you're all sitting down at the table, does conversation stop as soon as they walk in the door? You know, those are the kind of things that, that can really be a clue to parents sometimes that they're, um, I, I don't can can make it, I guess, raise the anxiety level unnecessarily. So I want to be as welcoming as possible. And, you know, the good good feelings and the smile goes a long way with some of those pieces, just making folks welcome to the meeting and start it off on the right foot. Um, I've got a, sorry, yes. I've got a couple of questions. Sure. Um, if you've reached out several times to a parent to set up a case conference, at what point is it okay if you've reached out three, four different times to send them a formalized notice and say, here's when we're meeting, please let us know. At what, what point do we kind of put a time limit on that? So I think probably a lawyer would be a better responder to that, that question. <laughs> but typically uh, we have, we go through the rule of three on, on those kind of things. We give three, it's that's varied and repeated responses uh, is all that the, our opportunities is, the, is all really the Article 7 says. So okay. mainly what that, what that means is we have to try different ways. We don't just keep sending an email home and hope for the best. If, if an email didn't work, we want to try the different means for our subsequent attempts. And it needs to be a matter of kind of your school policy, I think, if you want to set it, because it's not, a, a no number is set in Article 7 as far as that goes. Okay. Um, so there's not anything like that. Um, there's situation. No matter what you do, as far as it being, a, if it's an initial case conference, the parent still has to sign, implement the IEP, no matter what happens. Right. Um, but and if the student's already eligible and it's a it's a annual case review, then you know if you've given your due, if you've done your due diligence and documented everything, you might hold the conference. I would give them every opportunity to virtual phone call, whatever it happens to be, to give them every chance to. To go forward you know you, you're going to have those situations though and at the best and i know bruce can probably comment better than me on on these these pieces but documentation is key and and you over document everything as you get into those kind of situations and um and again give them every opportunity you're going to have the situations where folks just are not interested don't want to be a part of the meetings and that you need to document that too so they mm -hmm. might tell you to go forward i've had that happen to me when i was teaching yeah. Uh, when a parent just, well, we trust you, and and I was like, I'd really rather have you there anyway, even if you, even if you'd rather not attend the conference. But um, right. now, Bruce, do you have a? I know you probably have a lot of experience. No, it's kind of it's thing. really about documentation, and we used to, you know, in my in my former role, we would, you know, we had a file on each kid, and there's a a sheet of paper, uh, maybe a little bit. Um, antiquated system uh but it was on a file and just left the message on the you know three three attempts and then we'd mail the notice a um, little bit of different process a little bit more uh urgency when it was an initial and we had a timeline we were facing um but it, a lot of folks don't know there is a documentation system in the iep system where you can you can document right within there within the students um you know, IEP information, um, contacts with parents or attempts for that. So that's helpful because it's all there in one place. But yeah, just document your attempts and do the best you can, mail, email, phone call. Okay. Thank you. That. I'm actually a special education teacher going into an admin role next year. So we're actually developing those uh, procedures. Okay. So that's why I kind of ask. 
Teachers in our co-op were very lucky because we scheduled everything for them. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it kind of I got to see exactly how our secretaries and scheduling folks did it. Um, so they would just document very carefully and, and be frustrated and and all that stuff. But we, you know, it was we we took that off our teachers plates as much as possible. And it was kind of selfish reasons. We'd also know what our timelines were. Um, and we, we didn't miss them very often since we were in control of that. But it was a lot of work. So sorry, I got sidetracked. And then <laughs> I just had one more quick one on the predetermining. Um, this has kind of come up recently. If you possibly put a put potential TOR on there to help with the development of a possible IEP, is that predetermining? Right. Because I'm in a very specialized no. program. So most people know if my name's on that, right. where they might be getting most of their services. I, I think the key is, is phrasing the might and maybes in that correctly there. There's no determined, nothing is determined. And sometimes it's it's important to make sure parents, you know, have those conversations prior to the meeting to make sure they know that mm -hmm. we're just thinking about this, even, mm -hmm. even though you might be the, I guess, proposed teacher of record. That doesn't necessarily mean that's where you're going to land. If, you know, if I had a if I had a choice and there were already was a teacher of record and they were thinking of bringing you on, I would leave the other teacher of record on there and have you there. Um, and then we get to that piece in the IEP where we talk about different uh, placement categories, kind of flesh that out there that that was mm -hmm. discussed and what was decided upon. That's a piece of the IEP that's kind of neglected many times. It's just done as an afterthought. But and you don't have to go through every. 51, 52, 53, 54, just pick two or three where you discuss a little bit what's most appropriate and, and just take a few minutes and put down some thoughts why the why you came to that decision. And then, mm -hmm. you know, that could be why you were you were there. You could, you know, you could be at the at the meeting, but if you had a choice and you didn't have to be teacher of record until that decision was made, I would do it that way. But I don't, I don't think you'd really be in that much um, hot water if you went ahead and were teacher yeah. of record. Because I'm thinking more of on those initials. Initials, know? yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it, if it was an initial and you're the, the potentially the program that they're going to qualify for, I think it's appropriate that you would be there. Yeah. As teacher of well, record. And as and we think about predetermination too, what I, what I, when it's obvious is sometimes when you have those meetings when it's just a matter, of, I don't know. Everybody here has probably bought a car or a house or something, and you just get a piece of paper to keep signing. And that's what predetermination really is at its core, is it, it, your, your input doesn't really matter. Uh, we're going to do this no matter what. That That's what predetermination is, is that, that based on what we know about the student ahead of time, this this equals that. And there's no discussion about changing that we're just explaining it to you. And that's, that's really what's going on. So it's similar to buying a a used car, I suppose. They're just to kind of explain it to you. You're going to sign off and, and get what you get and when you draw off the lot. So that's that's what predetermination is. So as long as there's a thoughtful process, uh, like Bruce said, including those uh, those disparate voices in that decision, I, I think you're going to be okay. Uh, and some folks will go so far as to um, share, I guess, the IEP ahead of time. So and that it, whenever you do that, if you give them a draft copy of an IEP, you want to make sure it's very clear that that's what it is. It's just a proposal is all it happens to be if that's your pop procedure, but um, it needs to be real clear that we're not determined anything yet. Perfect. Um, if I yeah. could jump in as well, I think it's sure. important that parents understand we owe it to you and your child to have all possible resources available coming into this meeting. So we have a lot of folks here. We have folks here with different experiences who can add to our meeting or you know, add to the meeting and help us come up with a, uh, an informed decision that's in the best interest of your child. So that's why we brought these folks in. Not because that's the way we're headed, but we owe it to you and your child. Yeah, we're looking at all the viewpoints, of, of when, especially for initial, we're not sure. And um, sometimes when we go through, we're pretty sure that we still have a lot of discussion to make about what it's ultimately going to look like. I appreciate your questions. That made, made us all think and, and jump in. So that's a good, you know, that's a good question. And we all get to, to jump in a little bit. I did want to talk a little bit about ca cautions and concerns uh, just briefly. Uh, this is something we kind of made a list of things not to say at a meeting, and we could probably go on uh, with this, but uh, we don't get to say, hey, here's the timeline. Here's how much money we have. Sorry, we don't have the staff for that. Uh, we just get to say, 
well, we understand the students' needs and here's what we think we should do. You know, here's our plan, here's our proposal. Um, the other thing is to, uh, <laughs> I don't know, some of these are kind of silly, but you, you don't want to bring up other students in the meeting. Like, oh, this is just like what we did for Matt last year. Like that, you know, it's not just like that. It's maybe similar, but we this is specific to this in, in student. And be, be aware of the jargon too. I know uh, we talked about that already a little bit with some of the documentation, making sure parents can understand it. But as we're talking at the case conference, sometimes I feel like folks are intentionally doing it to leave somebody out of the conversation and we never want someone to feel that way, even if that's not true. So be thoughtful about that in the in the words we use and the and what we write as well. So as we document things in the IEP, think about making it accessible to parents as well in that setting. Um, placement decisions. We kind of alluded to this already. That, uh, but we want to base our thinking in every student be starting in general education first and that we have to justify their removal. So that's that's our baseline when we go into a meeting and we have any discussion about special education, we start in general education. Every student begins there, no matter what their eligibility area happens to be. And then we have to justify the removal. That's the way the IP works. We never have to justify placement in general education. We have to justify the removal from it. So we, it's, it behooves us to do everything we can to find ways to um, accommodate to de deliver the students services and program in the general education setting whenever we can. Uh, if it's not possible, if we as a, meet, a committee, we determine it's not possible, then we have to look at, well, what's next? What, what's the next uh, stage we need to look into? Can we include, how much can we include the student in the classroom? And then we start uh, figuring that out from there and look through our, our placement categories that way. Um, least restrictive environment, we talked about this. Now, one of the things that, you know, I, I've talked to some districts, you don't have to have someone on hold here if you if you don't have a, a resource room or a self-contained environment, right, or any students that uh, fit that criteria right now, doesn't mean we have to have a, a person with no teacher sitting around waiting for someone to show up. And what it means is we have to consider these things. So as a, as a, as a school, as a school district, Think of how would we provide for these different categories? So we have to have the means to provide for them. If even if no one's using them right now, someone might come along tomorrow that requires a self-contained environment or a separate setting or something along those lines. So what's our plan for those situations? Whether it's going to be partnering with a different agency or or um, leasing services from somewhere else, or we have to hire someone new. Uh, we have to consider those kind of things so we're ready when this occurs. So when that student enrolls, we have something we, well, here's what we're going to do. Here's the plan uh, that we have. Or here's what we're thinking about anyway. So let's talk about that. So um, this is the, the the range of placements that are available as far as uh, in, in, our, in our systems, in our state rules. So gen education, general education starts first. Uh, we don't want to do jump, big jumps in this without having discussions about the steps in between. So from general education to homebound or hospital should take a little discussion. Uh, like Bruce said, we don't necessarily have to talk about every single piece, but we do have to mention uh, some steps along the way. Uh, key things, interaction with parents are is an opportunity to build a relationship. Every member on the team has an important role to play. Uh, we talked about the public agency representative, but everyone at the meeting has something to do. Um, the administrative role, the pu public agency's role is typically more about managing that process. So making sure we get, that's one reason that we have an agenda. So making sure we meet, we follow the process the way we're supposed to. So there's no procedural issues and we can get that through. The content of the IEP is typically the teacher of record, that development team's responsibility, the public agency representatives make sure the process is followed. Uh, if we follow both those things, procedures and processes, we can have a pretty smooth result uh, when all said and done. So sorry, John, it took a little longer than expected, <laughs> uh, but I appreciate we had a lot of good good questions and I appreciate those those pieces. I think we're ready to hand off as John just suits him perfectly to the challenging behaviors. Uh, so <laughs> give him some opportunity to talk through that for us and uh, and kind of wrap it up for us this evening.
Thanks, Matthew. I uh, I think I got this because I I was one who it was a challenging behavior kind of kid, so it's probably apropos that I talk about this. Um, prevention is the key to everything we do, and I, and I will tell you as we talk about prevention and responses, this is where we do a gut check as administrators. Everything we've talked about. First of all, we have to look at our mindset. What is our mindset? Are, are the students their students, the special education kids? Um, what do we really think and how do we think about the students we're serving? And if we see them as separate um, and not responsibilities, but liabilities or problems, this is one more thing. We got another case conference. It will come through. We are very transparent in our thinking and beliefs, parents can read that, teachers can read that. So we have to be very parallel in what we say and what we do. And to be parallel, it really comes down to what we truly believe. And uh, so I would I would really urge you to take that that self-reflection, that gut check and say, what how do what do I think about students? How, how what do I believe about serving students who have all students, all students, high ability. Uh, students with special needs, with a specific learning disability, students who are just in there plugging away and, and doing at grade level work and, and doing well with that. What's my why? Because we will be transparent. So looking at prevention, emotion drives attention and attention drives learning. So when we look at solid tier one behavior, mental wellness, uh, we are looking at academics, we are looking at anticipating what might happen and preventing that from even occurring based on our planning. We've talked a lot about with our, our timelines and, and um, uh, case conferences. We've talked a lot about this must happen here, this must happen there. It comes down to procedures and protocols. So as administrators, what procedures do we have in place? If my why is I want to serve these kids, all students and staff and parents uh, to the optimum level, I want to be the person, I, I want to make sure that we have a culture that's accepting of all students and parents when they come into this building, they will be successful. That is my mindset. They will be successful. Part of that is having processes and protocols in place and working how I as a, as a principal work with my staff, how I work with, with parents. So a solid tier one in behavior would include, for example, having, you know, the, the word discipline means teaching and training, instruction and training. That's what discipline means. It's not a punitive term. It's about training and instruction. So that solid tier one, in this case in behavior, is about having protocols in place for students and teaching the expected behavior. And again, when I say emotion drives attention and attention drives learning, I say that because the emotional part of it will drive the behavior. Our school culture, again, prevention, is having a, a culture in place where students can come in and go, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> of all places, this is the place I want to be. And same with our staff. So that solid tier one, I cannot stress enough, is key to prevention. And that comes to us working, having our mindset, a positive mindset, and having things in place, protocols, procedures in place ahead of time. That's all prevention. Appropriate tier one and uh, tier two and three supports. We're looking at Making sure when we do that, though, when it talks about, for example, emphasizing modeling re relationship building, we have to make sure ahead of time that our teachers have those skills, that they have the skills for the positive behavior um, in classroom management, the organizational skills. That goes back to us again. And, and I would ask you to be thinking now, as administrators, moving into next year now, what what ideas do you have in place? What plans do you have in place based on your reflection from this last year about relationship building? Uh, building? Teacher supports, what teacher supports are needed 
let's say organizational classroom management, what organizational supports are needed for this teacher, that teacher, and so forth. What teacher, what supports are needed um, for teachers to provide uh, or to initiate positive connections uh, with identified students, all students, but identified students. I would challenge you to, to ask your staff, are there any students here who are left out? Can all students go to an adult in time of need? Do they have a trusting adult that, to, to whom they can, they can come? And so looking at the, the support, the uh, teacher-student relationships, the, um, the relationship building that we talk about above, all of this comes down to our role as administrators to make sure that culture in place where we believe that students are important, staff are important, and parents are important. We have the, the, the um, framework in place to develop that trust and, and that culture so that solid tier one instruction uh, not only is in place, but has meaning and is authentic, okay? Go ahead, Matt, Matthew. So discipline, it means training and it means instruction. Let's say that we have in place our tier one behavioral supports. Students all know and staff understand, have a shared understanding of terminology. And students understand terminology, understand what the rules are, not the rules are, the expected uh, behaviors are. And those rules, um, best case scenario, would come from a, a larger context. For example, respect. Respect is, is what we expect in our building, and we teach respect. That would then apply when students are, if you hit someone, disrespect, if you talk back to a teacher, that's not showing respect. So these, these rules or these expectations are in place. Tier one, they're taught, they're reinforced, they're practiced, but now something has happened, as it will. So let me ask you, what protocols do you have in place or what procedures do you have in place then to reflect? environmental conditions what was the where was it is that is that is the uh, cafeteria a place where we generally have issues like this uh, what are those conditions what are the adult behaviors are the adults frustrated can i help alleviate that frustration in any way again collecting the data based on what's happened now that something's happened collecting this data reflecting back on the student was there a plan in place and if so, was it being followed? Um, does the student even have the skill to respond appropriately? For example, if they're receiving specially designed instruction, social skills and with using, let's say, social stories, um, looking at that data and saying, did they, did they even have the skill to respond to that appropriately at this point, based on what we've been uh, teaching them and working with them on? And, and if not, how can we teach and reinforce that skill? And um, so there are a lot of questions. The key is when something happens, we have these preventions in place. We have solid tier one. Students know the expectations, we're rocking and rolling, we have a great culture, still things will happen. So now we go back and we, we have procedures in place to say, okay, let's look at what happened. Let's look at the environment. Let's look at the adult behavior. Uh, let's look at the student's capability. Okay, Matthew. If a student is removed, a removal is, any part of the day is considered removal in special education, uh, unless it is something that's pursuant to the students within the student's IEP that that removal uh, can occur. But a removal, any part of the day is a removal and certainly a suspension is, is, in, is included in that. Um, they may be, um, ISS, the removal, it's a removal unless the student has the opportunity to participate in gen ed as they as other students would and still receive those services in the IEP and they or they participate with their non disabled peers um, to the extent that they normally would. So when I had students that would, would come to me for a period of time, uh, let's say we're in school suspension, we had students that came in and we had teachers working with them, we had uh, peers that would come in and do groups. Granted, it was in a smaller atmosphere, 
but we still had they they were expected to and we were expected to uh, provide learning they were expected to learn even though it was a different environment it was a removal but it was a removal uh, within the school and Again, having those procedures in place, we knew where the places would be. We knew uh, the teachers knew what the protocols were for, okay, a student is here. Now, what are we going to do? Because we want to make sure that we're still providing that student with the, with the uh, general education and special education uh, needs that they have. And by the way, transportation is, is part of that. Uh, a bus suspension is a removal. Uh, unless you provide that alternative transportation. And as a transportation director, I had a number of cases where students been removed, but they still have to be here. So what are we gonna do now? And I would work with the principals and uh, sometime uh, my cohort in the central office, the superintendent to uh, come up with that. So you have to be created, creative in those cases. Okay, Matthew. So, whether it's consecutive days or whether it's cumulative days, 10 days, the key is 10, um, is constitutes a, a change in placement. And we must, first of all, determine whether it's happened. So keeping those data, keeping that data is, is essential. Uh, there were times that uh, in working with our my teachers in my building, it was, uh, okay, how many days is this? And we are, admittedly our records were not where they should be was that student removed part of that day or not and we were scurrying around trying to look at what is it 10 days is it nine days 14 days where are we so <laughs> having that again first calls procedures i'm speaking from experience because things that not necessarily work well all the time but things that didn't having that that tracking so that you know if a student's being removed if it's going to then constitute that change in placement Hey, Matthew. When that occurs, we've talked about the notice of procedural uh, safeguards earlier. Uh, both Matthew and Bruce talked about that. We must notify the parent and send a copy of the procedural safeguards when that change of placement has occurred, that 10 days. Um, it should happen ideally that day when the decision is made to make that to have that removal make that removal if not uh, we want to make it uh, mail it as soon as possible at least uh, not later than the next day uh, to mail that out i made phone calls uh, to make sure that the parent understood what was going on would invite the parent in let's talk about this again the more personal that that gut check the more personal we're talking to a parent whose child means you know means the world to them reaching out to the parent here's where we are they have a lot of questions sometimes they're angry at first i understand that let's talk about what happened now here's your notice of procedural safeguards remember at our case conference i explained these to you and this is where we are this is specifically where we are in those safeguards these are your rights these are your responsibilities and these are our responsibilities to make sure your child is successful but here's where we are why we are now let's move forward so you also want to make sure that um, any manifestation determination is then scheduled and conducted within the 10, 10 instructional days um, of making that, uh, that change of placement uh, decision. Okay, Matthew. Again, communication and clarity. And I'm, let me add communication, clarity, and sincerity are critical. So... It's important to keep your teachers a record in the loop about discipline, um, that they're compliant. And again, having those protocols, procedures in place so that it's it's tracked, you have that system, um, that they're counted accurately. Um, you want to, again, make sure that if there's ISS, if ISS is going to, is, is part, of your, um, part of your procedures, and again, they were for us, um, what services are going to be provided? Again, that that should be ahead of time. You shouldn't. That should not be reactionary. It should be uh, a part of your prevention and part of your procedures planning. Um, but I would also, you know, we talk about teachers of record. Make sure your general education teachers are aware of this. We we talk about teachers of record and teachers of service, but we also have said a number of times that students are general education students first and foremost. 
So we want to make sure our general educators, our, our uh, general education teachers are aware of and truly understand what is change of placement. I'm going to kick this child out of my class. <laughs> okay, not so fast. Let's talk about change of placement. So when part of that communication is making sure that it's not, you know, we've talked about parents and, and uh, special education staff, but making sure general education teachers are very clear on the procedures and um, uh, the protocols and the uh, what the legal requirements are for um, any change of placement. Okay, Matthew. I'm watching the time, so I'm, I'm trying to, if I, if you have questions, throw them in there. I'm, I'm trying to make sure, make this as coherent as I can in the short amount of time. Um, so we have a manifestation determination. Or we, we, a child has, we have a change of placement. Now we have to determine, was this due to the child's, um, was there a relationship to this, this disability? Um, or is it something that we did as a, as a public agency, we failed to um, implement the student's IEP with fidelity. And um, these are questions that um, when, when I've been at uh, manifestation determinations that really need to be based on objective data. Not I feel, not I think, here's what happened, here's what we saw, uh, here's what the student did. Here's what the teacher uh, teacher did. It has to be based on data. It's really you really walk on on some rocky grounds. Parents can say, "I feel, I believe." We have to be based on um, facts, practices, and and actions that were taken. And the more we stay on that ground, not only legally sound, but our moral responsibility to provide that that education is preserved when we can stay with those facts. Facts. So we're looking at is there a direct or causal causal relationship uh, based on the disability or our failure to uh, to act with the IEP. Matthew, when we have the meeting, we're going to look at the information. Again, that information should be data driven, and and we're not going to overwhelm parents with it. It's just going to be very very clear, very factual. And we want to make sure we we um, we term we provide things in terms of not derogatory I, that's not the term derogatory or accusatory but you know the, the we want to make sure it's factual uh, the student reacted in this way the student through such and such not the student was was mad um, screamed and yelled, a student raised his voice, did this, uh, did such and such. We want to make sure it is is in a very um, non-judgmental, sterile way. This is what happened. Here's where we were. This was the time student, um, this was happening at the time, student re responded like so and so. It, it, so we want to make it very factual so that we, um, and again, based hopefully on how we feel innately about students and, and caring about students. So we provide things to the parent in a way that they're gonna be emotional enough that, that will not evoke more emotion. I, I see, I told you, you never did like my student. This is, this is what I expect. You know, we've stated it in a very clear and concise way based on facts and based on data. And based on that information, then um, was the conduct caused by or had a direct relationship to the um, substantial relationship to the disability, or was it a result of our failure to implement the student's IEP? And go ahead to the next slide. And if you're, um, when you're looking at these, these circumstances, uh, again, the characteristics of the disability, the history of the behavior, the characteristics of the student's disability, again, all factual, what happened, all factual, and review the implementation of the, the IEP. And by the way, if there was a behavior plan and was not followed, that goes to that second question. Were we following implementing the IEP with fidelity? So the next slide then, Matthew, is if, if the answer to either question is yes, then the conduct was a result. Uh, either of the, the student's disability or our failure to act. 
then we have to look pretty quickly, especially with that second, what what did we do or not do? And we're morally, um, legally responsible to to take steps to remedy that. But the student then, we we the student is is not um, The actions that follow that have to be, uh, you, you still have to provide the the, uh, the services. There have been times when we've had students that uh, there was a manifestation, we determined that, and then when we looked at the IEP, and I think it's in the next slide, Matthew, we looked at the IEP and based on some of the, the way the IEP was written, um, there were some options that we could take uh, after that, uh, let's say with a, um, placement within the school, more supports. Uh, there were things, for example, and I'm trying to be clear on this, but when a student had acted a certain way uh, in third grade, moved to fourth grade, did great, moved to fifth grade, did great, and then sixth grade, you know, the, the lid came off and he was back to the way he was acting in third grade. Um, we were able at a manifestation in sixth grade, believe it or not, with some extreme behaviors, look back at what was happening in, in third grade and fourth and fifth, and based on what didn't work and what was working, we were able to come up with a, a plan that would work for that student and still provide services. So um, you'd almost have to go down back to the um, specific, specifics of that, and there were there was a lot behind that story. But what I'm saying is um, we have to look at the root causes. Um, for us, it can be training communication to staff, but we want to determine immediate actions to prevent further implementation issues. And with this particular student, there were protocols put in place in fourth grade and fifth grade that we had forgotten about. And in sixth grade, those were not happening. So we immediately went back and said, why, why aren't we doing this? Let's let's do this again. What what happened to that? It fell off. It wasn't in the in the IEP. It was just good best practice. So again, we looked at data. We looked back at facts, and we found out that there were some things happening that were preventing this behavior in those those previous two grades. Um, and then look at any con, uh, compensatory actions that are needed to occur. Okay, Matthew. So. If the conduct was a manifestation of the disability, we wanna look at an FBA and implementing a, a functional behavior assessment, implementing a behavior uh, intervention plan if it has not been done. If they've already been completed, then we wanna review that and determine what changes need to occur within that plan. Again, our whole purpose uh, doing that gut check and the way we, we truly feel about the student, we want the student to be successful. Our emotions may say, he did this, I can't believe he did this, I'm upset about it as a, as a principal, as a, as a teacher. Um, that aside, we want the child to be successful. So let's look at the behavior and inter intervention plan and make any changes that are, that are necessary. Um, and then return the student to the placement they were moved uh, unless there's um, uh, a modification in uh, as part of the behavior intervention plan. I know we're running over. Let me just uh, touch on this slide and then um, ask for any other questions that you may have. Um, Matthew, I don't know how many other slides there are. I don't have that in front of me, but I know there are just a couple. But let's quickly look. If it was not a manifestation, the case conference is then um, um, going to look at that we may proceed with disciplinary procedures. In other words, if it was a manifestation, there are certain things that we must that must happen to make sure that's not happening because the student will be re receiving services back in the original placement. Here, it's not a manifestation. So what's the appropriate services? What's the appro appropriate placement? Um, but we have to continue participation to the extent possible in that Gen A curriculum, even though it's another setting, progress toward meeting those goals, um, even though it may be in another setting, and then receiving appropriate um, assessments, FBA assessments, and uh, behavioral services, and, and really looking at your specially designed instruction and those goals are those speaking to, if it's a student who's had behavior issues, let's look at our specially designed instruction and are we, are we supporting that student in that regard? Um, 
these are some exceptions. Um, when we look at, and this was mentioned earlier with Bruce, we look at weapons, um, providing again that those are uh, procedural safeguards. This um, carrying weapons, um, drugs, either possessing or um, selling drugs, um, inflicting serious bodily injury. Um, in those cases, uh, if a manifestation is conducted, um, the student can remain in that alternative setting. Um, at that time, and and it's important to understand. I I just uh, I was just with a school where there was an alternative setting, and there was uh, even a concern about that setting causing some of these issues. But be that as it may, again, looking at the environment. Um, the uh, determination, you know, when it was conducted, he was going to remain in that setting, and there were some changes made in that setting that that made a difference overall, from what I understand. So, um, but there are exceptions when the student is in that alternative placement um, due to these serious consequences, um, and or manifestations conducted, and the student remains in that that um, that setting, they would not go back to the. Uh, the original setting, go ahead. Okay. Um, Matthew, Bruce, with the slides that we have left, there are just a couple, um, but I want to wrap up on where we were, though, running through so rapidly because I was trying to coherently cover that in like 35 minutes, which is hard for me to do if you know how much I talk. And um, well, that's a lot. Um, and it's kind of there's a lot of, of, of different components and pieces there. So I think the most important right. thing, I guess, is having that that it's all everything we've talked about. It's based on our belief and what our true beliefs are and what we portray to our staff as administrators, as well as students and parents. And, and we don't want to be a counterfeit in, in what we what we say and do. It has to be based on how we truly believe. So, so there are, are there questions from our remaining participants? Certainly, they're gonna. There have to be questions. But time is short. Um, <laughs> they're probably thinking about all the kids that are vaping that they have to sit through these manifestation determinations <laughs> for. They have nothing to do with their disability, but they still have to be there for the meeting. Um, yeah, I, I, I think one student. I think I did three in a year. Um, but anyway, those are the rights. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I put this into the, the chat. Uh, but there is a link to an evaluation for today, so just make sure we just ask you to complete that before you, as a kind of an exit ticket to this uh, this evening. Um, recording of what we did to, tonight would would should accompany an email that comes out to you with a mm -hmm. certificate for uh, the session uh, this evening as well. And uh, before we go, this this is our contact information. It's in the Padlet. It's an end of the presentation. So if you have any specific questions that uh, maybe you didn't want to bring up today or that are, occur to you later this evening as something wakes you up in the middle of the night, oh, I wish I would have asked this, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We would be more than happy uh, to, to work with you individually. And I should also mention that our, we do a lot of training around uh, these kind of things for administrators and for teachers as well. So uh, if there's a call for some work in individually in the district, please don't hesitate to reach out. We'd be happy to come to you and, and work with administrators that way as well. Uh, and that is, we love doing that. So if you have any needs that we can help or resolve, we'd be happy to step in and do that. So um, don't be a stranger. This, If this is a, your first time working with us, this could be the beginning of a, of a long relationship, we hope. 